I don't even know if I recognize college football anymore. NIL, the transfer portal, and what seems like endless conference affiliation jumping often leaves me with a headache. Well, let's just say that headache turned into a migraine this week after an earthquake struck in the Pac-12. The entire L.A. media market suddenly banding together to bolt the pack for the Big Ten. Of course, a move like the one that USC and UCLA made affects the entire landscape of college sports, especially a program like the University of Utah. And stand by because a lot could still soon happen as a result. But Jeff Reinier spoke with the voice of the Utes, Bill Riley, to get his take on what this means going forward. Your reaction when the news broke, and now that it's official, the USC and UCLA are heading to the Big Ten. Uh, it kind of feels like, Jeff, we went back 11 years. I remember when this, remember when the whole Wild West thing was going on with the Pac-12 and the Big 12 and who was staying and who was going. And that really, that was the time that opened the door for Utah to get into the Pac-12. I was shocked, but, you know, I guess nothing should really shock us anymore in this day and age where the almighty dollar rules. But for the Pac-12 to lose... Really, it's flagship institution because, let's face it, USC is kind of the face of the Pac-12 and UCLA. And then on top of that, you lose the Los Angeles television market. That's a that's a bad day for the Pac-12. Us here, we're concerned about Utah. What yeah. do you think happens to the Utes next? I don't know. There's still so many moving parts. We have to see what, you know, what's next with the Pac-12 conference. I mean, I, you know, Utah's a member of the Pac-12. Until they decide to leave on their own, nobody's kicking them out. So we've got to see really what the next domino is. You know, again, this is all speculation. We all have our own guesses, but I don't think this is the, the only or final move. You've still got Oregon. You've still got Washington. You've still got Utah that are prominent Pac-12 schools. Does the Big Ten stop now? Or are we on pace for a super conference? Is the SEC done with Texas and Oklahoma? Or might they reach for a Clemson? or a Florida state. And what does the big 12 do? You know, the big 12 just, you know, a year ago at this time, they were in this same boat. Now the shoes on the other foot, they've got their 12 teams, but to keep up with say the big 10 or the sec or even the ACC, does the big 12 make a move? And would they make a move to add two teams or four teams to get the 16 themselves? And if that's the case, who do they make a move for? So there's so many moving parts here. I think it's just way too soon to know how it impacts really the rest of the Pac-12 or even the University of Utah. Do you think they've positioned themselves into a spot where they're attractive enough to say the Big Ten says we need to add a couple more teams that Utah would be on that list? I think they would certainly get consideration. It depends on what the number is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is the number two? Well, if the number is two, my guess would be Washington and Oregon would probably be one and two. I think Utah would be on the short list. But here's the thing. I think Utah's positioned itself well enough to where they're not going to be left out in the cold. Whether it's the Big Ten or it's the Big 12, I think Utah will be an attractive team if, if the Pac-12 does, you know, cease to exist or shrink a little bit more. If offers are there, I think they're attractive enough that they'll, they'll get attention from either one of those conferences. If only BYU had their media day a week later, we could have asked them about that. Despite some key injuries, BYU had a pretty good defense last season. They did finish a perfect 5-0 and against Pac-12 after all. One of those injuries was losing Keenan Peely in week three. But Peely is back now, all part of a returning core at linebacker that is really, really deep. Yeah, I knew right away something was bad because I felt like this pop in my knee. So I was like, oh yeah, it can't be good. And I had a you know rough night, but after that, it's kind of been all nice and, and downhill. Physically, you're hurt and you can't play. It's tough to watch those games. You're like, oh, I, I wish I could be in there making those plays, playing with my brothers. But, you know, it just makes you more motivated to get back and play. A lot of those injured players from last year are back. I think we were in the first four to five games last year, one of the top defenses in the country. And so from that perspective, we're, we're ready to perform well again. But at any time, guys can go down. And so I think what we have to do as coaches is be more prepared to do a better job of plugging guys in when those injuries occur. So much depth, especially in the upperclassmen. Um, we've got back, you know, Keenan Peely and, and Peyton Wildar, Max Tooley, and 
Um, you know, all those guys bring a lot of experience. The linebacker room's deep. You got a lot of guys you can trust, and I'm just grateful that, that the coach have, has that trust in us. I hope we can live up to it. We always talk about how linebackers lead the way, so we're going to put that pressure on ourselves to lead the way and, and, and make everyone else better. BYU will always have good linebackers, will always have good quarterbacks, always have good offense. Secondary is where the good teams are built at BYU, and I think we have that. People forgot how good we were playing for a little while. We lost some guys, but even then, we were still playing pretty well. Um, I think this year it's all about proving everyone that we can do this all year long. We got takeaways, but we need a lot more. We had tackles, but we had a lot of missed tackles. So it's like we need to just step it up and do what we got to do to make this season great for sure. So many different leaders in all position groups. You know, the defensive line, Tyler Batty and Caden Hawes and Lorenzo Falte. Kudos to Coach Turiaki. You know, he's he's a brilliant, a brilliant mind. Um, you know, just, just this game. Um, the, the guys that we have are playing relentless. I would want us to be a physical defense that the offense can rely on. Last year, especially towards the end of the season, the offense seemed like to be taking the brunt of the load and you know we want to take some of the load off them. We got to be the most physical guys in the field and and show everybody else that this is what we're all about. Mentality. We got to have that mindset that we're going to be hunting down these tackles and hunting down the ball carrier every every play and we have the mindset that we're going to go out there and work every practice every play and then production making plays find a way to make tackles and, and tip the football make an interception do something that changes the game and gives us the advantage leading the way in those three areas that's that's what our identity would be Utah may not be a baseball state, but Spanish Fork is without a question a baseball town. But it didn't just become that way. It's been building for decades due to some early mentors who had a passion for the game and found a way to rub that same passion off on others, one of which was rightly recognized over the weekend. My dad was born here in Spanish Fork, actually 1922. This is his 100th birthday. If only Phil Boyack were still around to see the impact he's had on this community after a stint serving in World War II, that service quickly transitioned to the diamond. Just got really involved in the Spanish Fork youth program. Eventually went up into the upper levels, never coached any high school ball, but high school age kids. Jim Shue Nelson did coach high school ball, 36 years in fact, for the Dons. I reaped a lot of the benefits. We were able to win 20, 21 region championships and six state championships and send 100 or so guys on to play college baseball to the next level. We take our baseball serious here and we're pretty dang good at it. But Nelson is the first to recognize those early baseball pioneers. To me, Phil Boyack was one of the ringleaders of those old timers that started the whole baseball tradition here at Spanish Fork High School. Baseball excitement started in the 60s, passed on to the 70s, and just exploded through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and to this day. From Little League to Pony League to Colt League, he coached it all. Per capita, Spanish Fork has the most baseball softball players anywhere in the United States. So, goes to tell you, it's because of people like Phil who make it their hobby, make it their passion, and have a passion for training up youth and helping them become better individuals. One kid there was a, a lefty that he had on this team, and that kid wanted to be a catcher. Well, Dad said, lefties don't catch. And the kid said, I want to catch, I want to catch. So he goes out and he looks all over town for a left-handed catcher's mitt, couldn't find one. Goes all over the county, couldn't find one. Finally found one on a Sears and Roebuck or something somewhere, and you know, that's the kind of thing Dad would do. When he was done coaching, he was far from done getting involved, even finding ways to fund what he loved. The old snack shack, for one, became a flourishing business, feeding locals on hand to watch the games. We had an old building, rickety building, where the top of it was a score booth. It's since been torn down. I just remember all the time that he'd put in in that snack shack. It's such an important part of this community now. Yesterday, Phil's legacy was officially recognized after his son Steve had an idea, one that the Spanish Four community responded to. I think he made a Facebook post like, I'm in, count me in, I'm donating. The dedication of a special memorial bench in his honor. So what do you think of it? I think it's beautiful. Yeah, Phil's, Phil's up there smiling right now.